Meditation has been touted for decades as being able to make the world a better place. Meditation techniques in a secular format claim to offer the hope of a better self and a better world to many. In the late 1960s, the Beatles began learning and practicing transcendental meditation. Seeking inner peace and contentment, other celebrities followed suit. In the early 1970s, those practicing transcendental meditation, or TM, announced openly that the rising number of individuals practicing this technique would lead to world peace in the short term. The Dalai Lama claims that, quote, if every eight-year-old in the world is taught meditation, the world will be without violence within one generation, end quote. However, researchers from the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and the Netherlands have found that meditation does not change how adults behave towards one another. The team of researchers reviewed more than 20 studies that investigated the effects of various types of meditation to make that conclusion. Initial analysis indicated that meditation did have an overall positive impact. It made people feel moderately more compassionate or empathetic compared to if they had done no other new emotionally engaging activity. However, a further analysis revealed that meditation did not reduce aggression or prejudice, nor did it improve how socially connected someone was. It was revealed that the trendy Buddhist practice of meditation does not make you more compassionate, less aggressive, or less prejudiced. It has been said that, quote, one of the great mysteries of Christianity is contentment. At least one must presume it is a mystery, because so people, so few people live it, end quote. In the 1600s, Preacher Jeremiah Burroughs referred to Christian contentment as a rare jewel. Considering the variety of issues Christians continue to struggle with, it seems safe to say that Christian contentment may just be as rare in our day as it was in the 1600s. Yet the scriptures tell us to be content with what you have. A contented Christian is the one who best knows God's sovereignty and rests in it. A contented Christian trusts in God and is the one most willing to be used by God, however God sees fit. In Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul wrote, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. Paul had learned the secret of contentment, and it is a secret worth learning. Here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul used one of the great words of pagan ethics. He said that he had learned to be autarkia. We translate this Greek word content. The word means entirely self-sufficient. It's defined as sufficient in oneself, adequate, self-sufficient, needing no assistance. The general idea of this word, contentment, is independence from outside circumstances. It is the opposite of unrest, worry, and anxiety. Paul was saying that he could face anything. He could have nothing, or he could have all things because in any situation, he had Jesus Christ. People of the world have no idea what this means, not really, and unfortunately, many of us Christians don't seem to know either. Sometimes all of us may act like we don't know what contentment means. Yes, there's a lot of discontentment in the world. Philip Parham tells the story of a rich man who approached his large, beautiful boat, and he was disturbed to find a simple common fisherman sitting lazily in his small fishing boat nearby. Why aren't you out there fishing? he asked. The fisherman said, well, because I've caught enough fish for today. The, the, the wealthy man asked, why don't you catch more fish than you need? The response was, well, what would I do with them? Well, the impatient man said, you could earn more money 
and you could buy a better boat so you could go deeper and catch more fish. You could purchase nylon nets, catch even more fish, and make even more money. Soon you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The fisherman asked, then what would I do? The man said, you could sit down then and enjoy life. The fisherman said, what do you think I'm doing now? We live in a world that breeds discontent. We are bombarded with the message that to be happy, we need more things. We need less wrinkles. We need better vacations. We need fewer troubles. But our problems in life will not be resolved by having more stuff. Our problems in life will not be resolved by having fewer wrinkles or better vacations or even fewer troubles, necessarily. Ultimately, the problem is the sinful human heart. We are often discontented in our jobs, our marriages, our church, our homes. In fact, most people are discontented in most areas of, of their lives. We can easily despair that we will never be able to attain contentment. But the Bible teaches us that we can be content. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, I will never leave you nor, nor forsake you. This is the point that the Apostle Paul makes in Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13. In that text, he says, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. People don't find contentment by getting more stuff. Someone said, help, I need stuff I don't need. That's what it's like to be out of control. Luke 12 verse 15 says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Jesus said that. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And people don't find contentment merely by learning to make do with less. A devout Quaker leaning on his fence one day, watching a new neighbor move in next door, witnessed something extraordinary to him. After all kinds of modern appliances, electronic gadgets, flush, plush furniture, and costly wall hangings had been carried in, the Quaker said, If you find you're lacking anything, neighbor, let me know and I'll show you how to live without it. Lack of contentment will manifest itself in attitudes and behaviors that bring harm to ourselves and others, regardless of how much or how little we have. The parable of the prodigal son tells about a young man who was discontent with life, and in trying to find pleasure and happiness, he nearly destroyed himself and everything he held dear. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 13, Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got, got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. The parable goes on to tell the results of his behavior, his desire to pursue more things, his desire to find peace, happiness, and contentment in things and stuff and activities of the world. When we consider the ups and downs in the life of the Apostle Paul, it's significant to know that Paul learned contentment. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, we've read this a few times already, Paul said, I do not say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. In verse 12, we just read, Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content. Twice in this passage, as I emphasized, Paul said that he had learned to be content. 
And the word secret further suggests that contentment is something we have to learn. Some people may seem to just be born laid back and content, but for most of us, when life unleashes itself on us, contentment does not come naturally. A recent study showed that people today have their best chance to be content in the year that they turn 74. Well, I guess that gives most of us something to look forward to. And I suppose that if you're not content when you're 74, you know you've really made a mess of things. But that's a little late to have figured that out. The fact that Paul refers to contentment as a secret or a mystery indicates not only that contentment does not come naturally, but also that how we pursue contentment is contrary to human ways of thinking, which is perhaps why many people don't discover it until the age of 74. For example, the world typically teaches that the way to achieve peace and contentment in your life is to get out of difficult situations that cause you hardship or are not personally fulfilling. That reminds us of the prodigal son. But Paul clearly indicates that he has learned to be content both in good situations and in bad, including prison, which is where he was when he wrote that letter. Moments ago, we mentioned the more is better mentality, which teaches us that to be satisfied in life, we need this product or that gadget. Those are the affluent, those who have the best our society has to offer at their disposal, their houses, their summer cottages, their winter chalets and automobiles are the envy of the community. But examples throughout history, as well as contemporary times, along with multitudes of quotes by the sages throughout the millennia, all echo the sentiments expressed earlier by Jesus in Luke chapter 12, that things, stuff, possessions don't make us content. We also mentioned the simple living mentality, which says that satisfaction comes by getting rid of stuff and living with less. Well, there's some biblical truth to the thinking that we should not give ourselves to the pursuit of earthly goods, but a simple lifestyle alone does not guarantee a contented heart. Yet Paul said that he had learned to be content in both plenty and hunger in abundance and in need, and also in difficult situations. If money cannot buy contentment, and if poverty doesn't provide it, what is contentment? And how is it attained? There are three basic elements to learning to, uh, learning to be content. First, we must realize the fact that nothing of an earthly nature either lasts or satisfies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, Paul, after listing many difficulties in verses 8 and following, Paul said, We do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Second, in order to learn contentment, we must have confidence in the fact that we actually have God in our lives. And having God in our lives is contingent upon us. It's contingent upon our behavior. It's contingent upon our attitude. It's, it's contingent upon how we respond to the will of God. John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus said, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. 1 John 1, verses 6 and 7, John writes, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. In chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, in that same letter, John says, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Verse 5 says, whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. In chapter 4 of that same letter, verses 12 through 16, John writes, 
No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Third, in order to learn contentment, we must have confidence in the wise and loving providence of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul wrote, All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things, all this care, all this providential concern of God will be added to you. You will be cared for. Another word we might use is the word trust. Trust that God will provide for those who seek him first. There are also definite evidences of discontentment. When certain attitudes and characteristics are present in our lives, it is evident that we are not content. One clear evident of evidence of being discontent is murmuring, fretting. Murmuring is self-destructive and murmuring is harmful to others. And murmuring also brings the displeasure of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10, Paul said, Don't murmur as some of them also murmured, referring to the Israelites in, in the wilderness, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Anxiety is a clear indicator of dissatisfaction with one's circumstances. Paul writes in Philippians 4 verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And he follows that by saying, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And fear is an obvious evidence of discontentment. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul described that peace of God that I just mentioned, which passes all understanding. If murmuring, anxiety, and fear are a regular part of our lives, we have not learned contentment. The world teaches us to escape situations that cause discontent. It teaches us to either try to accumulate more possessions or to, to abandon them or to just be indifferent towards all things. Contentment is not based on where you are. It's not based on what you have. It's not based on what you don't have. Contentment is not based on the absence of difficulties, and it's not based on being detached or not caring. Contentment is based on recognizing that nothing of an earthly nature either lasts or satisfies. Contentment is based on having confidence that we actually have God in our lives. Contentment is based on having confidence and trust in the wise and loving providence of God. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, Paul wrote, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul said, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus.